it's uh, Thomas Lange from Cologne, or Köln as we say in German, and it's about the fully automatic installation of uh, not only Debian, but also Solaris and whatever. Uh, so have fun with Thomas. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, that doesn't matter. <laughs> It's not a bug, it's a feature. So, an uh, overview. I want to give a short introduction why automatic installations are very important. Then, one or two words about uh, the planning of a computer infrastructure. Then, I will show you or explain you how FI works. A little comparison between DI and FI, and uh, some things about the FI project, the present, and the future and uh, I will also give a little show. So, what are the values of your computers? Or what happens if your computers are not running for one hour or for one day? What are you doing? Are you going to eat? Are you reading a book? Or are you in really trouble because you have to do very important work? So, um, how important is a computer infrastructure for you? It is running all the time. There are several values included in the computer, services, applications, but also data. And if your uh, computers are not running, for example, you cannot write builds and you cannot get um, the money from your customers. So that's very important. Uh, so save these values. Most people are doing this very well. They are using tape backups or they are using snapshot. They have a, a high availability file server, that's very good. But is data backup the only thing you have to do? Have you really saved everything you need for running computer infrastructure if you only do data backups? So there's one guy, um, Steve Traugott, who uh, created the, the word computer infrastructure. He gave a little test. Grab a random machine and the machine where you did not do any backups, you do not need backups because all your important data are on a file server. So grab one of those machines and throw it out a 10th floor. We're just doing it, or I prefer the DD command. That's better than throwing the machines. And now the task is recover all sysadmin work uh, within 10 minutes. Can you do it with your type of backups or installation or something else? Who thinks that he can does it with one, one, two, so two, yeah, two and a half person think they can recover the whole machine uh, within 10 minutes. Who likes to install these machines by hand? Oh, no, no, I, uh, who likes to have these machines? Yeah, <laughs> that's everybody. Only my electricity bill pays for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, these are three examples that are all installed with Phi. Uh, on the right side, these are small computer, uh, small robots, 100 robots, and they are driving through a floor and try to discover the whole floor. And uh, they are running Debian on it. And they, they installed the machines with Phi. So these are some examples where, where everybody thinks, yes, I cannot do it by hand. I have to create an automatic type of installation. Or another example, can you guarantee that all these machines are really, really equal if you install them by hand? They should have the, the same configuration of all applications and whatever. And this was an example also by Steve Traugott, who works at trading floors, where is it very, very important that the machines are very equal. Uh, so really 100% equal. Even there's some, some bug in the configuration, all machines have, need to have the same bug. And you can't do this with some sort of manual installation. So, something about manual installation. The, f the major thing that drives me to create a fully automatic installation that I'm very lazy, and no simple task is fun more than twice. So even typing the root password bothers me a little bit. Uh, a manual installation lasts many hours. Uh, for the basic install, you can do it in maybe 20, 30 minutes, but then you, you have to tune the, the whole system, and this will last many hours, and 
you have to answer all this, these questions. And you, if you have several computers and you want to install them in, in, a, in a common way, you have to enter this data or these questions, you have to answer them again and again. And you can't do parallel installation. Maybe you can do two installations with your two hands, but uh, that's the limit. So I think repeating tasks are very stupid. And if you are doing stupid and boring work, you will make errors. If you have to type the root password for 20 machines, so you have to type it 40 times, you will make an error, surely, pretty surely. And also, since the manual, since the manual installation lasts a long time, nobody will do a very good documentation of everything he, he configured on the machines. And then the question is, can you rebuild the machine after a week or after, mother, uh, after a month? Do you really know how the configuration was made two months ago? I'm pretty sure I, I couldn't do it after two weeks. Uh, so you have installations that are unique. And normally, unique is a very uh, positive word. But in this common sense, unique uh, is not good because we, we want to have uh, um, very equal installations. So the, the sum, summary is a manual installation does not scale. That's very important. So we, we have two, two things that are bad with manual installation. You can't reproduce them, uh, and they does not scale. So why not fully automatically? It's very quick. We can guarantee identical installations even after several months. Um, we can do some disaster recovery, as seen in the test. We, we can manage it to recover a machine in, in, uh, within 10 minutes. With one command, we can install 100 of machines. That's no problem. And if we have different types of hardware or different types of configurations, that's very easy to, to handle, and just, it scales very well. And so we can save very much work, and for the companies, it's very important to have less work and you can save time. There are some estimation about how much you can, um, um, how much uh, cheaper is it if you have uh, automated configuration installation or uh, IT work. Uh, they say manual IT work is twice as uh, much as uh, automatic uh, work in IT. But the important thing that you should have a plan for your computer infrastructure. You have to, to plan it. So now, what is PHY? PHY does everything a system admin, and I think most of you are the system admin for your company or for your computers yourself. So everything you have to do before a user, an end user, can log into the machine. And you've got a brand new machine, and everything you have to do bef before you can give this machine to your users and they can work with it. Um, it's a server-based tool, and we are using scripts. And uh, so since we are only using scripts, we have open source by design. And we, currently, we can install Debian GNU Linux, and also we did it for Solaris. It installs and configures the whole operating system, but also all applications. So after a fully automatic installation, the machine is ready to go. You do not have to do anything uh, by hand because it's, it's completely installed and configured. We also do not use a master or golden image thing uh, and deploy this image because I think this also does not scale. There's only one exception. One uh, told me in a file tutorial, he said, oh, I'm doing uh, an image-like installation and it scales very well. And said, no, it does, will not scale. And said, yes, it scales because I'm creating the images with Phi. And that's OK for me. If you are creating the image in a fully automatic way and then deploy this image, that would be OK. We have a class system. And this class system provides uh, very fine modularity. And uh, we are also very flexible. We can expand or replace certain functionality inside Phi. But there's, there's one disadvantage. Phi can't plan your installation. But if you plan your installation, then Phi installs your plan. So uh, a few words about infrastructure thinking. 
uh, you, you do not have to look at a single computer. Have a look at your infrastru infrastructure, which services are needed, uh, which application do I need, or which tasks do I have to do in my normal work. There's a very good website called uh, infrastructures.org, and uh, the paper from Traugott and Huddleston uh, calling bootstrapping an infrastructure. You should read it. It's, it's a very nice paper. And if you say, say oh, no, I want to, to recreate or want to start uh, doing computer architectures, um, infrastructures, then record your actual state and think about things maybe you want to change now. And, but bear in mind that uh, your system will not be fixed. You have to be flexible for the future. So um, also version control, all configuration data should be put in version control and keep in mind, for example, this is the, the one data, one source thing. Uh, for example, in Kickstart, if you have several machines, you have only one Kickstart file for, for one machine or a, a group of machines. So normally you, you, you will have a certain or several um, kickstart files, and if there's one data, for example, the name of the time zone you have, this is only one information, but you have different sources of this information because you must put this information in, in every single kickstart file. And with file, we can do it another way, so we have only one source for one data. There are also some questions when you are planning the infrastructures, very um, high-level questions, but also very detailed question about what is the IP address of your DNS or NTP or, or whatever. Uh, I do not want to go into details in, with this foil. So how does FI work? First, there's a sysadmin point of view, and this is the nicest point of view. It looks like this. You can go to a rem very nice remote site, and the only thing you have to do is just boot uh, type in a command that boot up the machines and then you can go to uh, vacations and that's all. But there's also the technical point of view. <coughs> As I said before, uh, it's a server-based uh, tool. We have an installed server on the left side and there are three main parts. The first part is the NFS route. Um, the install client, the machine that gets installed, is running as a diskless client during the installation. And so we need a NFS route for this diskless uh, system for running. Then we have the configuration space, and the configuration space is only a directory tree with certain files. And this configuration space holds all configuration information for all clients you are installing. So even if you have uh, three departments or whatever, you can put all the configuration data for all your departments and all machines in one configuration space. And by default, we are mounting this configuration space during the installation via NFS, but that's also no problem to use a CVS checkout or a HTTP uh, request to, to get a tarball and then to extract this tarball on the install client and to use it. And we also need uh, um, uh, access to a Debian mirror and the normal ex uh, protocols are supported. The, the whole configuration is on the install server and also all log files from all installations of all machines are also installed on the installed server. So we have a central repository of configuration but also of the log files and we can control all install clients from the install server. But the installation itself really runs on the install client, so it really runs on the hardware where, where, it, show, uh, where it must run after re the rebooting. And what's also very nice for debugging uh, or for, for looking at the installation, we can log uh, into the install client during the installation via SSH. So we have also during the installation, full remote control over the machine. What do we need? Uh, a server with DHCP, NFS, and TFTP. Uh, this need not to be an, um, a Debian machine, but it's easier. But uh, you can also use a Red Hat or a Solaris machine or whatever uh, system is providing these services. Uh, by default, we assume that the install client uh, has a network 
card. Uh, it's very good if there's a boot prom on it, but we can also boot from CD or we can also do installation uh, from CD. But the default thing is boot your computer from network card. Um, we do not need floppy disk, CD ROMs, keyboard, graphic cards, and so on. So uh, in cluster environment, you also uh, mostly you have this, uh, this cluster nodes sometimes without uh, video card. That's no problem to install these things also with file. The access to the local Debian mirror. And we do not need that much disk space on the installed server. Uh, the biggest thing is the Debian mirror, and today, <laughs> nine gigabytes, it's, it's no problem. Disk space is cheap. And since the, the file package or the configuration space and also the, the NFS route is, is shared among all machines, this does scale very well. We do not need much, much more or any more disk space if we install one or thousand machines. We have constant disk space. Uh, if you do image installation, um, it tends to be need, that you need more uh, disk space because uh, when you start using image installation, you have only one image, and then with the time you have a testing or production image, and then a, a, another kind of um, image. But this, today, disk space is cheap. That's not so important. Yeah? No, if you, the, the question was if you boot from a local media, uh, if you still need HTTP support uh, or access. DHCP. Uh, DHCP, no, you do not need it. So the, the sequence of the installation, the first part, and this is the most time consuming part, plan your installation. That's very important. So by default, the install clients boot from its network card via Pixie boot. Uh, that's very common today. Gets the kernel via TFTP. And then it boots the Linux kernel, and the Linux kernel mounts the NFS root. <coughs> and then the machine is running like a diskless client. So we have a whole system running on the install client without using the local disk. And this is also kind of a uh, a uh, disaster re recovery system. If, if the disk fails to boot, for example, the bootloader was destroyed, but there are still some data on the machine, I can boot this, this machine uh, with a normal setup and try to, to recover some data or do a backup of a partition. So it's, it's just uh, you, you get this feature for nothing. It's, it's like a life, no, not like a life file system, but you have the uh, disaster recovery. Then the main script is started, and this main script is a shell script, and this controls the whole sequence of the installation. Then we are doing hardware detection, therefore we use discover true, but you can also define um, kernel module, modules that will be loaded. So if discover true does not dis detect some certain hardware, and you have planned your installation, you know your hardware, then you can say for this kind of machines or for, for machines with a certain hostname, please load uh, a certain list of kernel modules. Then, define, then we define classes and variables. I will explain this later. And then we have a partition, written a partitioning tool in Perl that uses SF disk. And yeah, you will see this, there's a very a flexible configuration file for partitioning. So after we have partitioned the, uh, the hard disk, we mount the file systems, and then you are, we are doing the software installation. At the end, we save all the log files to the local disk, but also to the install server, and reboot the new machine. Uh, something about the class system. A host belongs to several classes, and the the list of classes is only an ordered list. We have a priority, uh, and in this example, its default has the lowest priority, and the classes are mostly written with uppercases except for the host name. And so the host name in this example, it's called demo host, has, uh, most, has nearly the highest priority. We also defined a class last for some, some special things. Uh, it's very easy to, do, to define classes. Uh, we have a directory called file class, 
And in this directory, you can write whatever script, shell script, Perl script, or even execute some, some uh, executables. And whatever these tools write to standard out are automatically defined as a class. So, so you are very flexible how to define your classes. And all the, the other parts that come after the, the class definition are using these classes automatically. And um, there's, there's a special command fcopy, which also uses the classes for copying uh, templates, different kinds of templates. So, and what's very nice with the system, we have a two-level kind of installation. Uh, if you have a senior sysadmin that, that plans the infrastructure, creates the classes, writes the configuration and the scripts for these classes, and then you can uh, have a junior system admin that only needs to pull out the new machines, put on the cables, and assign the classes to the machine, and then push on the power. That's all. Uh, so that's very easy because then the PC installs itself. <clears throat> this is a more detailed look at the conf configuration space. In this is example, we have three scripts called uh, that start with digits uh, that are used for defining classes. And the Firebase and German.var files are scripts for defining variables. In this config, we have several uh, templates for the disk partitioning. And you see the, the file names are the names of classes. So each install client knows by itself to which class it, it belongs. And then file selects the, the configuration, the partitioning configuration with the highest priority. So if you have a, a machine called foobar04 that also belongs to the class firebase, uh, the, for the disk partitioning, the file foobar04 will be selected because it has a higher priority. For the software package installation, there's a um, subdirectory package config, and there we choose several uh, files for, for creating the list of packages that should be installed. So this is an example how we can define classes. Uh, we are using very simple Unix or Linux commands, and everything that they print to standard out will, all, will all automatically define as a class. If you like to, to put all your, your assignment of classes to the host into a database, no problem. Write a simple, simple shell script that it extracts these data, these class information outside, uh, then that receives it from the database and just print the class names to standard out and uh, then the classes are defined for the clients. <clears throat> for defining variables, we use very simple shell syntax. That all, that's all. So no magic in it. Now the disk partitioning. That's a, that's a very nice configuration script. Uh, it's written in Perl, but uh, it uses SF disks, so there's a limitation that we do not support all architectures. Uh, as you can see, uh, first we have to define if we want to create a primary or logical partition, then we define the mount point, uh, the size, for example, the, the swap partition should be from 50 to 500 megabytes. We, have, we, we can also give some mount options and also options for the creating of the file system, for example, the min-free or the the number of inodes can be defined. <coughs> and now the, the Perl script detects the, the, the available hard disks. For example, this configuration, uh, it says disk config disk one. So it's a configuration for the first hard disk. Whatever, even if it's a serial ATA, a SCSI, or uh, an uh, IDE disk, this tool will detect the first hard disk, and then it will partition this disk. And it tries to maximize all the values. So there's a scratch partition where we said uh, the size should be zero and up to whatever you can have. Uh, so yeah, it will take the rest if all the other partitions have their maximum uh, size reached. Currently, we can create x2, x3, uh, DOS, XFS, and RISEFS uh, partitions but it should be no problem to create other kind of file systems. 
RAID and LVM is currently not supported, and that's the reason why we want to rewrite the script from scratch. But um, there are some guys that that doing also RAID and LVM uh, configuration with Phi, and therefore they write some scripts. You are not that flexible then, and and even with the Itanium or Spark and yeah, or all the architectures that do not have the SF command. You can use some simple shell scripts and use part add for partitioning. Then you are not flexible with this format, but hopefully we'll, we will have this new, yeah, uh, this new partitioning tool. So now uh, the file system is uh, the file systems are created and mounted. We have to install the software, and a very simple ASCII file format. You can define which packages should be installed. We are using apt-get or aptitude, the command line interface for installing it. And uh, you, here you can do some, some logical AND because the configuration file is called Beowulf and there's a line packages install Beowulf underscore master. So the packages G meter D and Apache will only be installed if the machine belongs to both classes. So it must belong to Beowulf and Beowulf Master. But all the other uh, packages there that are listed there are installed for all machines that belong to the class Beowulf. We support also the dpackage get selection format. So if you have a machine already installed and want to install this list of packages, no problem, just uh, use the output of this command. <clears throat> After the software is, is installed, we, we are calling some scripts. And there we are also flexible because we support very different scri scri script languages. And for each class, you can call one or more scripts. And I will show you some things later. Can you please stop talking things? Um, now the example for the fcopy command. Uh, often you, you have several templates for a configuration file. For example, uh, you will never uh, configure an HTTP config file with debconfig. Uh, you cannot answer that many questions. Or for example, the xf86 config file. For a very different uh, situation, most people will prepare a template for it. And now there's a directory tree where uh, etc x11 xf86 config4 is not a file, but it's a directory. And inside the directory, you will just put the, the command uh, the configurations with the name of the class. And then with a single command, with the fcopy etc x11 uh, x86 config4 command, each client selects by the list of classes and which which class has the highest priority selects one of these templates to install this template into the right location. So for customization scripts, you can use some shell scripts, or maybe it's more important, who knows CF Engine? Ah, that's who is using CF Engine for configuration? Oh, four, five, six, that's not that many. Have a look at it, it's very nice. I think it's, it has its power in, in certain uh, commands. For example, the append if no such line command. Uh, it's very nice. It's a long command, but you do not have to read uh, any manuals because you know it will append the f this line if it's not already there. Or the hash command lines containing. Uh, so if you have a config file that you only want to edit, so not create from scratch, CF Engine is very good in this for simple editing of files. So now some things about installation times. Uh, <coughs> the, main, the main part that takes uh, the most time during the installation is writing the software packages to disk. All other things um, are not um, that much important. And um, above, there's a uh, table where we did a cluster installation with a fast Ethernet. And we really started the installation of 20 nodes concurrently. And uh, this scales very well. 
somebody else told me that, that he did an installation with, with 60 machines and I'm not sure if it was uh, with the gigabit uplink to the server, but it scales very well. Often people complain, oh, you're using NFS uh, mounts that will not scale, but since we only use uh, read-only access, this really scales very well. So, who is using PHY? <coughs> uh, I've created a questionnaire and um, I have over 100 questionnaires that were returned to me and there are several um, very big cluster and for example the High Performance Computing Center North, they have two clusters and um, what's very nice, I'm not sure if one or both of these clusters were listed or are currently listed in the top 500 yeah? Okay, currently only one, only one cluster is listed uh, in the top 500 list. That's the list of the fastest machine all over the world. Um, so what's very important for me, please fill out the questionnaire. So if you're using Phi and you have some experiences, good or bad, or even if you only install one or two machines, please fill out the questionnaire, it's included in the package, and then maybe you will get onto this list uh, if I give the next talk. <clears throat> so, now a short comparison between uh, DI and uh, Phi. In, in, in my opinion, uh, one of the main reasons, or mo one of the main objectives for DI, it must be very small because the DI has to fit into the RAM. During uh, an installation with DI, everything is run from RAM, and we are using the NFS route. So since it must be very small, the only thing you can, uh, you can create this is that's very modular. So there are several modules, and if you do not need a certain module, you do not have to load it into the RAM. Uh, it's mainly a menu-driven manual installation of one host. This is the main purpose of the Debian installer. And um, first, is it asks for language, and after that, a whole of, or I think currently with, with, ten, with, with 10 questions, you can do the, the installation, but, but um, there are questions that you have to answer in a certain language. The Debian installer tries to cover the, the most common installations. So it's, we, we tried to, to make it for, for most end users very easy to, uh, to use the Debian installer. But if you have uh, very special environments, if you want to tune your system, uh, you cannot do it with the DI installer. You have to do it manually. And it only installs the base system. Um, after the, the Debian installer has finished and the base config is, uh, all other application and configuration parts have to done uh, by hand. And currently it only uses Discover 1 for hardware detection. Everyone says this is right or am I wrong with it? <laughs> so now, now the difference. Phi is more the infrastructure thinking uh, way of installing. So we do not look at a single host, we, we look at the whole infrastructure. It's a zero keystroke installation. And you first have to plan it and then only put on the power and uh, so there are no questions. So uh, I, also in Phi you, you cannot set a language. Uh, or something else be because there are no questions. So, so why should we set a language uh, in which a question should be displayed? Um, since disk space is cheap, uh, the NFS route can contain anything. So in, in DI, you are using the busy box versions of certain commands. So you do not have the normal commands with all the options and features. And during a file installation, we are using the normal commands, uh, we can install whatever you want uh, into the NFS route, uh, moon buggy will be added maybe in the next version or uh, audio support or video support, whatever, S since we, we are not limited in, in the disk space. We are using the classes for grouping 
and we have a so central configuration space for all the things. And we install and configure not the, not the base system, but ho the whole thing and all applications. And we are using Discover 2 for hardware detection. So before I, I start with uh, uh, telling some things about recent changes, I need a volunteer. One volunteer doing an installation. Okay, Enrico. <coughs> the first thing, the recent changes we did is uh, we created the Phi CD. This is a Phi CD. And now you should install the machine with the Phi CD. This one, please. <laughs> <coughs> so here's a, here's a, okay. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, what is a Phi CD? Uh, as I showed before, yes, just reboot and try everything. I will not explain that much. Um, normally, you have to set up the installed server and have has have the three parts. And with the Phi CD, we put all the things on the left side. The NFS root, a bootable kernel, the configuration space, and I think just put on the, put on the power. Yeah, I can do it. Okay. Yeah, OK. Uh, on the Phi CD, we have every th three parts that are on the left side. And if you set up an install server and do some installation, there are only two commands to create this Phi CD, and then the same installation that is n normally run over the network is then run uh, from the Phi CD. So <coughs> this is a simple grub menu uh, where Enrico can choose if he wants to try the automatic installation or the installation with GNOME or uh, a Phi installation without network or the rescue system. And I think he chooses the installation with GNOME. Yeah. Uh, then the zero keystroke installation is if you boot from network. Oh, okay. uh, and but, but but I can also create a Phi CD without keystroke. But uh, I I, so I I think it's very dangerous, and a lot of people will blame me if they put in this CD. So it's up to you. I choose. You you have I do not say anything. Yeah, you're a little bit in the camera, Enrico. We cannot see the oh, secret sorry. password. <laughs> <coughs> OK, now the, the kernel is booted with an initial RAM disk. This is for the CD detection. Normally, we are not using a, a kernel with init RD. <coughs> Uh, the password is that people will not blame me that they install a machine without. Oh, why couldn't I choose yes or no? So this is a normal screen you also see when you're doing a installation f over network. Uh, yeah, you can't read it that much. Uh, the hardware detec detection goes on. Now there you can see the list of classes that are defined. And then there's a, a simple sleep command. We, uh, we echo a beep three times, and then we sleep for five seconds. So this is the last chance to quit. And if you do not quit, the installation will start. Uh, now the make uh, x2 file system command is called for several partitions. And uh, maybe a little bit. Um, the, the config file for the partitioning was the Firebase because the machines belongs to Firebase. And yeah, I think we can leave it alone. Or you have to watch it. Yeah. That's very important. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and tell me if there are some errors. Or OK. So the Fi CD. <clears throat> um, we also create a depconf and preceding support uh, in, I, I'm not sure, in the 2.6 or 2.7 version of Phi. And currently, a nice thing happens because uh, 
until now I was the, the only developer. I also get some patches for certain people, but we had a developer meeting in April with about 10 people and there are about five to seven people that are very interested in coding much more than before. And so the file project moves from a one, one uh, developer to a small team. And uh, during the developer meeting, they also convinced me to, to include a new feature. It's called soft updates. Uh, so you do not need to reinstall the whole machine. If you make changes in your configuration space, you can say file soft update during uh, uh, when the machine is in the normal uh, running state. So you do not have to reboot it or whatever. You can just update your configuration. And we also created a Linux file devil mailing list. The, the file mailing list was uh, already there. Uh, one of the team members also managed to do Ubuntu installation. So some words, uh, he, here you say just, uh, see just apt-get or aptitude uh, that's installing the packages. And everything's okay with the installation? Perfect. No <laughs> error messages. It, it installed the G shell. Do we still need it? Uh, because I prefer the C shell. Okay. So, so that's my default. <laughs> So what are the future plans? Uh, we call them uh, or the, the future plans for Phi 3. Currently, uh, I finished, I think, today or tomorrow to replace our CVS repository with Subversion. Uh, we, cre we will create uh, a Phi wiki where we col can collect a lot of uh, information and maybe most parts of the Phi web page will go into the wiki. Uh, we want to split the file package in a doc server, client, or utils packages. Um, there are plans for replacing. Currently, we have a special install kernel, and we want to use the, the default Debian kernel for the booting up during the installation. Uh, the root file system is used uh, or is mounted read only, but uh, we need some files with writable access, and currently we are using Zimlinks to a RAM disk, and that's a little bit work, and I heard using device mapper and a RAM disk, it would be much easier to do it. I'm not sure if it really works, because uh, somebody told me it only, device mapper only works with uh, block devices, and yeah, we will look into it. Uh, a GUI is needed, surely. Everyone wants a GUI. And uh, we have a monitor daemon, so you can monitor the, the action of all the machines if you're doing installations in parallel. And therefore, we want to have some, um, some GUI. Yes, Henning? Uh, we're also planning to do um, uh, administration GUI. OK, we also, yeah, we also want to have an ad administration GUI. And, uh, we are working on it. OK, he's working on it. You can see it tomorrow? The first version? In half an hour, maybe. Half an hour, OK. Uh, the new partitioning tool, I already said it. Uh, we want to rewrite it, and we will. I think we will use a parted server. And then we need to include LVM and RAID support. There are two or three people start working on RPM distro support. So if somebody else wants to install some other things, subversion and arc support for the configuration space. We have some uh, testing or yeah, developer code for subversion support. And the F copy command should also be enhanced. So the summary, uh, there's a web page where you can find all information. We have two mailing lists. If you start with Phi, there's also the IRG Phi channel on uh, OFTC, Freenode. Freenode. Uh, um, I'm also most time of it on it, and yeah, it's very good to, to get quick help. Uh, you can see examples of the log file. The, the file CD image, uh, this one is for e3, e3, E386. You can have it. I have, um, I think, a 10 or so CD. If somebody wants to have it, no problem, or I can burn you one. There's also the Linux Tag DVD. I think uh, they have some more at the reception. 
And on this DVD, you have also the Phi system that uh, Enrico uses here. Um, what's very important for me are the Phi users that helps me to improve the system. For example, I only have access to a 386 uh, machine, but we, we have um, success stories for six architectures where people are using Phi for installing it. And the Phi project is more than five years old. So um, yeah, it's very important for a project not to, to, to work on it for one or two years or a half a year. Um, a, a project can only be very good if it lasts for a long time. Yeah, and the feedback packages are, in, uh, patches are important from the users. And there's also some commercial support, phicluster.de, that's me. So I'm giving Phi tutorials, but there are also some companies that are using this for installing the machines for their users. So that's all. Uh, I can see that the package installation of Enrico's installation just finished, and now the configuration scripts are, are running. And I think in, in, this, in a couple of seconds, we are ready, and Enrico can use his new system. With this example, there's a second keystroke because uh, we, we want to see the, ex, uh, the results. You can see the installation took only 487 seconds. That's about eight minutes. So we have still two minutes to be in the 10 minutes limit. And yeah, errors found in, in the log file. Just ignore it. <laughs> and <laughs> That's the easiest way. Yeah, type return, and then uh, you have to remove the CD. Otherwise, the machine will boot from CD again and again and again. Uh, I also have some flyers with some facts on it. They are at the door. So I now questions. Yeah. Uh, what's with the microphone? Yeah. Wolfgang. Yeah. yeah. Hurry up. <laughs> Time well, about. Well, well, uh, it's okay. Oh, oh, could you explain the difference between uh, system imager and phi? Uh, pardon, system image and phi. The no, system imager. Yeah. That's the tool for automatic installation yeah. that we used to use for you know clustering. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's like an image-based or async-based installation method, yeah. and this will not scale. Uh, next thing is uh, what you do with the tweaking of the system, because the problem is, you know, if you're doing update later, is and you are violating the, you know, the policies, you will have a hard time updating the system later. Is how have you solved that? Why do I have a hard time when I or update it later? Or we are also using um, or tweaking all the configuration files during installation. Yeah. And since we are basically violating a lot of the policies um, when you're doing an update, upgrade later, you know. Uh, but then, then you have to use dpackage divert. And if you use dpackage divert, uh, then the normal package updates w will not change, uh, remove your changes from the config files or from whatever. Does divert work on config files? What? Does divert work on config files? I don't know. Does anybody mm, know? I don't think so. <laughs> OK. So it should work, but it over there or Holger? So uh, you can log in with Demo. The user is the installation was Demo, and and the password is Phi. Um, regarding the config files, I pr rather propose to use CF Engine, where you can <coughs> make sure that you um, only um, edit the config file if it's not already added, and it does not really violate po policy because it's not a custom Debian distribution but an admin tool. So it's Okay, and the admin should plan the installation and do only upgrades. It's a problem when you upgrade from Woody to Sarge or whatever. And the other thing I'd like to add is that um, the soft update feature is really nice because you can update systems and you can also use it in the end of a DI install to um, then execute a Phi soft update. This is what I've done here. So if you netboot the machine in the dorm or in the smoky, then it first installs with DI also fully automatic, except for the question, do you really want to partition the hard disk? 
and then a file soft update is run to configure more classes based on the machine and install software based on that. And this is a, it's really a neat feature. I start here because I don't want to run, so. <laughs> Um, may a uh, file be also used for diskless uh, clients to... Yeah, yeah diskless, diskless clients is also... Uh, I, I also did it once and yeah, no problem. And how do you manage to... Uh, I mean, what I don't understand is if you have different diskless clients with different kernel images, uh, you have basically more kernel images on the fire uh, server? Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, one point about the images is that um, you can also use the file we've used it actually to install Red Hat because some people for some reason didn't want Debian. Mm -hmm. And um, but okay, my question actually is uh, I'm interested in um, how does the uh, file soft update work? Um, uh, then yeah. the file soft update runs most most part of the installation. It in, uh, it skips the partitioning of the disks, but then the software will be installed. Uh, so the normal software installation part will be called, and, and for most packages, uh, the message will be, is already the newest version. Uh, but you can also remove uh, packages in this part. And then the, the most important part is calling the, config, uh, the customization scripts uh, in a class-based manner. That's all. So this requires a reboot? No, no, no reboot. Uh, only if you installed a new kernel. Okay, so but so how, how does this work without, without doing a reboot? Um, you, need, you have a normal running system and then you just uh, set up the Phi infrastructure, it's just mounting the config space and then call Phi soft update. So no reboot is needed for soft updates. So, so it's handled by a cron or a um, cron job? You can handle it by cron or you can uh, just uh, do it manually. Okay, thank you. Um, about the users that are using Phi, I saw some people uh, that were afraid of Phi and thought that can be only used for clusters. Um, I want to say I use it at home for my four machines and I'm so excited about it that I started to develop it further. So, so don't be afraid, uh, use it for a small number of machines also, it's yeah. useful. It, it's, it's useful even for only one machine. If this one machine is very important for you and you, you want to have downtime with less than 10 minutes, uh, use Phi for it. Because if you have a hardware failure, just replace the hard disk or just get a new machine, restart the, the installation and then you're ready to go after a few minutes. So even for one machine, this would be okay. Okay, um, we are much out of time now. Um, I think uh, we saw that only very experienced Debian developers <laughs> such as uh, Enrico are able to use Phi. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, the normal users are left out as always. I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. It